All right, once again, time for some more questions. Uh, if you want to ask me a question, all you got to do is just go to any video on the channel, just post a question in the comments, and I will gather a bunch of them up and answer them here. Now, first, last week I answered a question about what human evolution might be for the future Martians, and I gave an answer that a lot of people had a problem with. So let me try that again. The uh, diversity of our genes across all humanity is actually very low. Human beings, even though we may look a little different, are actually very similar no matter where we come from, with Africa or Europe or Asia, very similar. Now what happens in evolution is if creatures are separated from the, from another group for any large period of time, then they will have a genetic diversity. And so you can imagine that if human beings are going backwards, back and forth from Earth to Mars a lot, then they won't change from us very much because we'll continue to mix with our genetic code. But if the Martians are cut off, and then they will evolve in their own separate path. Now what kinds of ways that they might evolve? It could be that they're going to adapt to the lower gravity, it might be they're going to adapt to the higher radiation on the surface of Mars, but we don't really know uh, until we find out. So for the future Mars colonists, if they do get cut off, then we will find out uh, how they're going to change. Okay, so first question. Seth Cooper, is there something preventing some organization from constructing an interplanetary ship in orbit piece by piece instead of launching like how SpaceX has proposed? So I'm going to assume that Elon Musk has done the math, that SpaceX has done the math, that, that using this large booster and then it turns into the interplanetary transport ship that has the people on board and it goes straight to Mars is the most economical way to get the most humans from Earth to Mars. But there have definitely been some other proposals where you would construct a large spacecraft in orbit and then you would then take that spacecraft to Mars. There's, you know, if you watch the movie Martian, there was this spacecraft that just traveled like a ferry from Earth to Mars and back again. And that's another idea as well. So we don't really know which of these systems is going to work the best until there's some practice and we've seen the different methods tried out. So for now, I'm going to assume that Musk has asked this exact same question and the engineers have done the math and this is the one that makes the most sense for SpaceX. No Name asks, do we only come into contact with the asteroids from the asteroid belt in our solar system or do we get hit by asteroids coming from millions of miles out of our solar system? Yeah, so I hate to tell you this, but there is actually a vast cloud of asteroids which are very close to the Earth on very similar paths to the Earth's orbit. And they call these near-Earth objects. And one of NASA's priorities is to find all these near-Earth objects in space around us, try to map them, and try to figure out which of them in the future could cause some kind of problem to us, could you know, cross paths with Earth and actually impact us. And as we've seen with Chelyabinsk and other things, these larger objects do crash into the Earth on a regular basis. So unfortunately, we are kind of in a cosmic shooting gallery. We do need to find out where these things are, and we need to minimize the chances that we're going to get hit by them. And if we find one that is on a trajectory with us, then we need to come up with some way to move it or destroy it. And unfortunately, we also get hit by objects that come from outside the area around the Earth. We get hit by comets. And there are asteroids that are on more elliptical orbits that can come out of nowhere and strike us. So it's both. We both get hit by the asteroids that are in, our, in very similar orbits to the Earth. And we also get hit by comets that are coming from far outside, out of nowhere, uh, right straight down from the Oort cloud. So it's kind of the worst of both worlds. Ian Brandon Anderson, how would we deorbit the Earth to counteract the smaller sun? So this is based on a previous episode where I said that you know one of the solutions to extend the life of the sun would be to kind of tear it apart into a bunch of smaller suns. And so if you did have a smaller, cooler sun, you would want to move the Earth so that it is orbiting this smaller sun. And you do that by bringing asteroids in and having them get very close to the Earth and then pass away. And they would do, essentially, they would do like a gravitational slingshot maneuver. They would absorb some of the Earth's angular momentum, orbital velocity going around the sun, and it would cause the Earth's orbit to spiral inward. And if you did enough of those, you would eventually get the Earth very close to the, to the sun. And, uh, or you can do the opposite, which is you can take asteroids, you can have them do a slingshot and speed up the Earth's orbit or raise its orbit so that it's further and further away from the sun and 
you know, when the sun turns into a red giant, you'll be further away from the sun. Dylan T. Don't say milk dromeda. Don't say milk dromeda. Don't say milk dromeda. Oh crap, he said it. So whenever I talk about the merger between the Milky Way and Andromeda, I'm going to call it milk dromeda. And the reason is because our other options suck. What is it going to be? Milkomedia? I hate that. It has to be milk dromeda. And the only way it will be milk dromeda is if we just say it again and again and again. So I apologize in advance. I will always say milk dromeda. So I got to make it stick. CW8JWH, would the Earth-Moon system have similar Lagrange points as the Earth-Sun system, or would that work not due to the Moon being tidally locked to the Earth? Thanks. If you watch the video that I did on Lagrange points again, there are Lagrange points, five Lagrange points between every two gravitational objects. So the Earth and the Sun have the five Lagrange points, and the Moon and the Earth have their own five different Lagrange points. So yeah, absolutely, the Earth and the Moon have Lagrange points. Daniel Wheels. If there's life on one of these moons with suspected water under the ice sheets, what's the best way to get it back to Earth for study, or should we even do that? Of course, we don't know if there is actually life under the ice on Europa and Enceladus and Ganymede and all these icy worlds, but we really hope there is, because wherever we find uh, water on Earth, we find life. So. How do we bring it back to Earth? Well, the really great thing is they've discovered these geysers, these cryovolcanic plumes that are blasting out of the, a couple of these worlds so far. And so the idea would be that you could fly a spacecraft through, collect samples, and then bring those back to the Earth and study them. And it would be very safe because you wouldn't actually be going down to the, to the moon and infecting it with our life. So actually this is great. And so Europa and Enceladus have done this great job to provide this. Now there are some missions off to Europa in the future. I'm not sure if any of them are actually going to try and sample the plumes. But now these plumes have been discovered, maybe that will get added to the mission. So that's the best way. The next best way, where you actually have to land on the surface and like drill down through the ice and send a submarine, that's going to be really hard, almost impossible. So let's hope that we can sample the life from the plumes. Ahmed Abter, what will happen if you travel at the speed of light and then you hit something small, like an asteroid half a millimeter wide, and the ship is the size of an aircraft carrier? Could happen, right? Yeah, if you're traveling close to the speed of light, then you're going to be encountering all kinds of debris in space, and they're going to be moving at close to the speed of light. You're going to be smashing into them at close to the speed of light. Might as well be that it hit you at close to the speed of light, which is a speed that rocks and stuff just aren't going. So it will release an enormous amount of energy, a catastrophic amount of energy, which is one of the reasons why you really can't travel super fast when you're going from star to star. So uh, this is one of the great risks about trying to make spacecraft go very quickly from star to star. It might be safer to just go more slowly. Rushwall. When we eventually start a colony on Mars, how will Martians mark their ages? Earth years? Mars years? My guess is both. So it's like the, those poor kids that are born on the leap years, right? And so they remember their normal years and then they remember their leap years. So they've got two different birthdays. They're not poor kids, they're lucky kids. They've got two different birthdays. So I bet you the Martian kids will remember how many years Martian they are old, and they'll also remember how many Earth years they are old. They'll have two different birthdays, twice the presence. I think it's a good way to go. Paranormal Cactus. Okay, I got an excellent subject for your next video. What type of animal species do you think will evolve next after humans are long gone? So I actually really enjoyed the comments when below that question back on the video, which was great. And a lot of great ideas. I mean, I think, you know, whatever is a highly advanced species right now is very intelligent is a likely person to come after us. But then you got to think about things like, you know, the dolphins, they don't have access to fire. Every fire they try to light just goes out again. They don't have thumbs. Uh, you think about the great apes, unfortunately, we're probably killing a lot of them off. They're all endangered. So if we go, they'd probably take them with us. No, I think the best animal that's next are octopuses. They have prehensile arms, they can climb out of the water, and they can go wherever they want. They're really smart. I think they're the ones that we should probably pass the torch of technology to is the octopuses. Also, probably not eat them as sushi anymore. They might remember. So, octopuses, next. And before you say it's octopi, Google it. It's octopuses. Hindos Gottenberg. Could Neumann probes work on an intergalactic scale, or is the space between galaxies too large? 
Yeah, there's no reason to think why the von Neumann probes couldn't travel not just between star to star, but actually between galaxy to galaxy. Uh, you know, if as long as the galaxies aren't moving away from each other at the speed of light, you could send a spacecraft from one galaxy to the next galaxy over. You might have to be able to get your probe going close to the speed of light. It might be really tough, but it should be possible. And so when people think about sort of the theoretical limits of exploration, it is the Hubble volume. What is the amount of, of galaxies that could be reached if you could travel up to pretty much the speed of light? And wherever that line is, whatever's within inside that volume, you could get there. And whatever's outside of it will forever be beyond our reach. So DX Newtonton, as the universe is expanding, will the light that's been stretched into microwaves all around be eventually stretched even further into the weaker bands of the electromagnetic spectrum so there's eventually no little or no frequency at all? Yeah, so as space expands, the wavelengths of the photons stretch out. And this is why when we see the afterglow of the Big Bang, which was once in ultraviolet visible light, really energetic photons, we now see them way down below infrared in, into the microwave spectrum. And so you imagine these photons just getting stretched further and further and further. And they'll eventually go down into the radio spectrum. And eventually there'll be these wavelengths that are gigantic that could be, you know, light years across. But the photon is still there. It's just that its wavelength has just been stretched way, way out. And there's no reason to see why this would ever stop. They just, they would never be detectable in the future, but they're still all going to be there. All the energy that was ever in the universe is all still here, just the universe is big and stretched apart. Silas G, would a space elevator work on the moon? Isn't the moon locked? A space elevator would work great on Mars. Space elevator would work even better on the moon where the gravity is even lower. And so the tensile strength of what you need to be able to have a space elevator work is even lower. The moon is locked to us for sure. And so what you would have to do is you would have to position your object somewhere around the Earth-Moon Lagrange point, which is that balance of gravity in between the Earth, the Earth and the Moon. And then as long as you can keep it there, you could then take a space elevator down to the Moon and then keep, take a counterbalance up and so the whole thing would be balanced. The Moon is locked and that's kind of a good thing, right? So the Moon is always just facing directly towards the Earth. A Lagrange point around the Moon would be a great way for us to lower stuff down to the Moon, bring it back up, and is pretty feasible. We could build one with the technology that we have. And we've done a bunch of stories on Universe Today. There's some great articles out there about what a, a lunar space elevator would be like. It's a great idea. We should totally do it. Okay, well, thanks everyone for asking all those questions. As always, if I get the answers wrong, please feel free to let me know in the comments. I know you will. Uh, and I look forward to all the future questions next week. <laughs> right. Wow, he really wants to be in the video. All right.